Hello everyone, today I'm working on a true R290 reach in cooler that's not getting below 18 Fahrenheit. All right, so let's head over to our refrigeration reach in troubleshooting chart and we're gonna do all our checks before we gauge up. So the first thing we're gonna check is the evaporator coil frozen. Okay, the second thing we're gonna check is our evaporator and condenser fans working? Is our condenser coil dirty? And is the compressor running? Once we verify all these things, we can then go over to our possible causes. All right, so our condenser coil is clean and our condenser fan's working. Our evaporator fan is working and our coil is not frozen up. All right, so we did confirm that our evaporator coil is not frozen. Uh, evaporator and condenser fans are working. Our condenser coil is not dirty and our compressor is running. So at this point in time, we can gauge up to see what's going on inside the refrigeration system. All right, so I've put a line tap only on the low side. I don't want to put too many holes in this system. So based on this, you can see we're pulling down into a vacuum. All right, so we're going to come over to our refrigeration pressure chart. And I did not take the high side pressure and I'm always on the text to do this because I need to know the full story but because it's an R290 system I just chose not to puncture another hole in the system just in case the customer does not go on with the repair I'm in a place where getting a hot work permit is going to be difficult it's like a seven story building so it just becomes complicated but any other time you definitely need to check your high and low side but if we look here, there's only two reasons why we'd have low suction and it's low charge or restriction or low charge and non-condensables. We're most likely going to have a low charge or a restriction. So generally at this point in time, this is where we would add in the charge and see if the pressures go up. So if we add in the charge, so let's say this system's like a four ounce system and we dump in two ounces and the suction pressure does not change. That means we have a restriction. Now, if we dump in two ounces and then the suction pressure comes up, we know we're low on charge. So once again, I never skip this step, but because of the price of R290, I'm not going to dump any refrigerant in the system. This cooler is probably two-ish years old. I'm going to jump right into a leak test. I'm pretty confident here. We have a leak. Now, the reason why I like to dump the charge in before going to the leak test is I don't want to waste an hour doing a leak test and my system was restricted. But based on these units and the issues we've been having, it's most likely going to be a leak. Now, I don't like using the word most likely. For those of you know that know my troubleshooting, I try to be always efficient in my troubleshooting. But in this case, based accurate. on the circumstances, the building I'm in, the cost of the refrigerant, we're going to jump right into a leak test. All right, so we're going to go ahead and dump some nitrogen in. I have 123.6 pounds of pressure. We know we have refrigerant in the system because when we started the system, there was refrigerant in there. And bang, there we go. There is our leak. It's on that cap tube area somewhere here. So let's just dial the meter back. We want to know the exact area where this is because this thing is a tiny leak. And we've pinpointed the leak right there. And we're going to get our bubbles on there. So it's on the back side. If you look at that bubble very closely, you're going to see it's getting a little bit bigger. And this one was a really hard leak to find. It is a tiny leak, but the leak detector don't lie. And right there, our bubble popped. All right, so you can see on the back side of this joint, um, they didn't fully braze this. So that's the reason for our leak. All right, so we should always be flowing with nitrogen, but especially when we're brazing near the cap tube, okay? So I have everything brazed up, and look at that. Leak is fixed. All right, so now that we completed our leak test, we'll go ahead and pull a nice and deep vacuum of 500 microns, and they're going to recharge the system. Now I am finding with these critically charged systems with the R290, if I put in the exact weighted amount, I'm not always getting the pressures I want. But regardless, anytime we're working on a cap tube system, we will base our charge on critical charge, obviously. But you'll find sometimes that when you dump the charge in, we're just not getting the pressures you want. So it's super important to know what the pressures need to be. So because we have a cap tube system, to figure out our suction pressure, 
we're gonna take our desired box temp and we're gonna subtract our evap TD in this case that is 20 Fahrenheit so that's been determined by the engineer from true manufacturing so I'm looking for about 35 Fahrenheit I'm gonna subtract 20 Fahrenheit and that's going to give me 15 Fahrenheit now everyone's always fixed on what the pressure should be but really it's all about saturation temperatures and once you figure out saturation temperatures you don't even look at pressures anymore but that's what we're taught in school so let's just go ahead and do it so 15 Fahrenheit so that is the temperature of the refrigerant inside the copper pipe so if we go to our PT chart here 15 Fahrenheit equals 36.3 psi and then to figure out our head pressure we're going to take our ambient temperature and we're going to add our condenser split so in this case it's 15 Fahrenheit okay I get asked a lot of times how do you know when it's 30 how do you know when it's 15 almost everything that's new is going to be 15 now okay they're doing this to help with the efficiency of the unit so in this case our ambient temp was 76 Fahrenheit we're going to add our condenser split and that's going to give us 91 Fahrenheit that is our saturation temperature that is the temperature of the refrigerant inside of the pipe but we can go here and figure out that at 91 Fahrenheit we're getting around 150.5 and that's for 90 Fahrenheit sorry I couldn't find a chart uh, that doesn't go up by increments of 5 so once we charge our unit we're going to be looking for these two values right here all right, so as I said earlier, our ambient temp is 76 Fahrenheit. And let's go check our final pressures with our smart probes. We are at 35 and 153, but more importantly, 14 Fahrenheit saturation, 91.5 condenser saturation temperature, and we cycled off at 2.3 Fahrenheit. All right, so we finished with 14.6 Fahrenheit. We we're looking for 15 Fahrenheit. We're good there. This range is very important that we're as close as we can get. So if we take 14.6, I won't be able to do it in this case, but 14.6 is probably 34 Fahrenheit. Okay, we can do a desired box temp all the way down to 33. So we're within the range. I like to use 34, 35, we're within the range. And then if we come to our high side, condenser saturation temperature, we had 91.6 Fahrenheit. Now this one you might find sometimes it's not exact it might be off by one or two Fahrenheit that is okay because it all depends where you take the ambient temperature reading from sometimes the panels are on sometimes they're off so don't focus so much on this one if this is off by one or two or three degrees that's fine the main one is here on a cap tube this is super important that we have the proper refrigeration temperature because if for instance let's say we get 31.8 psi so if we come over to our chart, 31.8 gives us 10 Fahrenheit. So 10 Fahrenheit, it's four degrees cooler, but at this lower suction pressure, we're definitely going to start to frost up the evaporator coil, which is going to lead to a freeze up. So it's very important that your suction pressures are dialed in super accurately. Our ambient temperature, we can have a variance of one or two degrees, that's fine. So as you saw, we cycled off at 2.3 Fahrenheit, we're all good on this one. 